In the 1970s, Bigfoot researcher Ron Moorhead recorded what is now known as the Sierra Sounds, the voices in the wilderness. What I have here is a CD player. Inside is a recording of the Sierra Sounds. Here I have an amplifier. The more adventurous among you when you hear these sounds, the first thought you have is to go into the woods and play these sounds to see what happens. But in interviews, the man who recorded the audio said that that would be a very foolhardy thing to do. To go out into the woods and play sounds, you have no idea what they are. You don't know what the reaction would be of a supposed creature upon hearing these noises. So to go out into the woods and play the Sierra sounds would be reckless and foolhardy. Well, the car of the day is the fool. So let's go. There's the amplifier, switched on. Track three, which is the first recording. It's number seven. It's like the whooping sound. So I think number 10 with the uh, whooping sounds where there's not like a dialogue back and forth between Ron Moorhead and whatever's making the sounds, I think that's probably uh, the best track to just play over and over again. What I think of when I think of call blasting, which is just a whooping sound over and over and over again. Yeah, it's really cool. It's probably the cleanest one on there. The whooping and, and whistling and stuff like that, some of that's really interesting. But, you know, a little bit, you know, it's just him trying to interact with Sasquatch, which I don't blame him for doing. That's something I would do as well. But, you know, it's, uh, there, there's someone here that are really good for just playing over and over again. And now I think what we should do, now that we've done that a bunch, is kind of just sit here and see if we hear anything back, see if there's any, you know, noise in reply. Nothing really out of the ordinary here, other than me. So, I think what I'll do is I'll play the number 10 one more time, and then I'll just stand here and see that I get a reply. Um, a lot of people, they, they find what they call stick structures. And it's mostly stuff like that, like trees that have fallen down or sticks that have clumped on top of each other. People will point to that and say that it's evidence of Sasquatch activity. And I really don't, uh, I don't see it that way. I think it's much more likely that the tree just naturally kind of fell that way through storms. And I find it kind of silly, the idea that a Sasquatch would make some kind of structure with sticks for some form of communication or something like that. I think it's pareidolia people interpreting things. It reminds me of divination, specifically uh, reading tea leaves or throwing bones or dice, things like that. They're taking the, um, the randomness of the way something falls, the way something lays, and they're reading meaning into it. I think a lot of um, Sasquatch researchers, whether they know it or not, are doing that with uh, stick formations. They're looking at these stick formations, the way they fall, they're looking at the randomness of it, and they're reading into it like divination. And so I'm not going to tell you that that is uh, a Sasquatch tree structure. If you want to read into it and interpret some kind of meaning out of it, that's perfectly fine. But I think it's something that people's minds do when they're in the woods looking for something unordinary. They're looking for something out of place, you know, and they, their mind goes to that. Because, uh, you know, when you typically don't find footprints or any kind of uh, strange creature roaming around the woods, and so what you find instead are tree formations. And so people kind of interpret those. If you look here, you'll see all kinds of different things that you could interpret as tree structures, you know, the different way these trees fall down. Potentially you could look at that and say, look, X marks the spot, but it's just the way that it landed. It's not, it doesn't mean anything unless you read into it, like, subjectively. Now the idea that Sasquatch would be leaving those as a sort of mile marker for other Sasquatch, 
that's a, a clever idea, but I don't really think that that's what's going on there. I think it's much more likely the mind. Sometimes people will find structures that look very, you know, out of place, where they have a bunch of sticks that look like they've been purposely laid on top of each other, or like rocks. They're like stacked up on top of each other. But I think it's much more likely that those are trail markers left by humans, because people will do that. Those are ways of leaving a landmark so that you can uh, avoid getting lost or have some point of reference. When people hear the strange noises in the woods, the ape-like whooping noises, I'm not really sure what to make of those. I can't really come up with a reasonable explanation why that would be. So I do consider those uh, potentially Sasquatch or potentially paranormal. I, I do keep that in mind. Of course, some of these calls can be faked when they're recorded, but I, I mean like when an average person, like when you go out in the woods, if you hear something like that, what is it? You know, I do think that occurs from time to time. I don't know what the noises are. I don't uh, dismiss them. I do consider them interesting. I'm not sure what to make of them though. I don't have uh, all the answers. A lot of people talk about wood knocks. They believe that Sasquatch can make these knocking noises in the woods. You'll be in the woods and you'll hear just knocking on trees, like someone is taking a stick and hitting a tree or knocking on a tree really hard with something. And so people theorize that this could be a way that Sasquatch are communicating with each other. And that's kind of a cool idea. But whenever people go in the woods, they want to try to communicate with the Sasquatch in the same way. They want to say, well, if the Sasquatch talk to each other by whooping, let's make some whooping noises. If the Sasquatch talk to each other by hitting trees, let's hit some trees. But the problem I see that I run into every time I try this, these sticks are very fragile. They're kind of like dead, right? That's why they're on the ground. They're not very good for hitting things. So if you hit a tree with this loud enough to make a knocking noise, every time I've tried it, it breaks in two. We're gonna try that again though and see if the stick breaks. I do recognize, of course, that people are hearing wood knocks. I've heard people say before that it's kind of like poltergeist activity and it is like poltergeist activity. The knocking on the, the walls in the haunted house, the knocking on the trees in a haunted forest. I'm not against the idea. I do think it's very possible that if Sasquatch exists, they knock on trees to communicate. I've got no problem with the idea. And as a fan of poltergeist activity, I do like the, the parallel, but I just wonder how they could be doing that. And this is some wood knocking. I don't know, maybe. If you could find a piece that wouldn't fall apart, maybe so. I know some people, they'll bring actual baseball bats and hit on the trees with them. I understand the strength of the Sasquatch, but I don't understand the strength of the actual material they're hitting the trees with. So perhaps the Sasquatch find a, a stick that is good enough to hit the trees with and they keep it, they walk around with it all the time. There have been Sasquatch sightings where the people say the Sasquatch is holding a club or a stick, but there's really not a lot of those. There's not like constantly Sasquatch always holding a stick. Sometimes they're just kind of wandering around. There's also this idea that it's kind of like a pattern, and I can get behind that because I like Morse code, and Morse code is a series of dots and dashes that are very simple, can be flashed with a flashlight, or um, knocked on, or you can blink Morse code. So if you can do that with Morse code, then it makes sense that they could have some kind of system of language like that, and I think that's interesting. Sasquatch from witness reports, they vary in size, but typically they're seven to eight feet tall when they're supposedly adults. So I think uh, it should be noted that Sasquatch, if they're gonna hit on a tree, would be up much higher than I was. You know, sometimes you gotta try to be serious, but sometimes you gotta embrace the absurdity of life and just kind of be a weirdo because you know never no one ever got anywhere by not being a weirdo so <laughs> some baphomet for you there and obviously there aren't any uh, sasquatch footprints if there were some i would show you but there are none i haven't even seen any uh animal tracks really and i've been looking so don't uh think i'm ignoring the ground i'm definitely looking at the ground and there are no tracks when you do sort of this thing, you have to expect that nothing will happen. And then, if something does happen, well, that's cool, right? So don't get uh, frustrated when nothing happens. That's, you're looking for Sasquatch, nothing's supposed to happen. And uh, remember that instead of it letting it be boring, you can make it common. When you're standing out in the middle of the forest, I mean, that's pretty cool. So you can just stay there and be serene and zen and calm with what you're doing. So yeah. If something does happen, that's miraculous. That's abnormal, that's amazing. So keep that in mind. 
And if you find just a, the slightest footprint or anything like that, consider yourself very lucky because it is, it's considered an unknown creature for a reason. It's considered paranormal and mysterious for a reason. When it comes to what you should bring, uh, typically make sure you know where you're going, but also uh, camera. And uh, if you have like a backpack and you're packing a bunch of things, you can pack um, you know, the equipment to uh, do a plaster cast. Uh, rulers and stuff to lay down next to the footprint for size comparison. Another thing you should bring with you, I think, is bring your belief with you. If you believe in Sasquatch, make sure you're thinking about that while you're there. Make sure that's in the back of your mind, in the subconscious, uh, ready to be sprung forward any moment. Make sure that in the back of your mind you're thinking about the possibility that this thing could just wander out in front of you right now. And if you don't have any belief, or someone like me, a little more skeptical, maybe bring someone with you who does have belief, borrow their belief. And that will, uh, I think, kind of fuel you when you're, uh, when you're in the woods doing something that's slightly silly. That uh, kind of mindset will help fuel you and help you continue to search onward. So some people, when they go looking for Sasquatch, they call it squatching or Sasquatch hunting, which I don't really like that phrase. But some people call it an expedition. I think that's a bit too fancy sounding. I think that sounds like you're doing something more than you are. Call it a nature walk if you want to. The idea of it being an expedition, I think, goes back to the abominable snowman. In fact, early reports of Sasquatch, they actually called it the American abominable snowman. And there was a great article by Ivan Sanderson that talked about that, that uh, inspired Roger Patterson to get into the field. So Ivan Sanderson, who wrote that great book, Abominable Snowman, Legend Come to Life, he really uh, you know, helped to popularize uh, the Yeti in the American consciousness. and. Uh, when the Sasquatch stuff in the 50s started going on, he was there too. So he was able to uh, promote that sort of thing. So without him, uh, Roger Patterson wouldn't have got involved, neither would uh, Bernard Hovelman, the uh, famous French author of On the Track of Unknown Animals. So the idea of it being an expedition goes back to those old school researchers who climbed the Himalaya mountains to look for the Yeti. And there are some people who go like really deep in the woods, places very far away from civilization. And that's cool too. That, I would consider that an expedition, especially if you're going out in the woods, in the middle of nowhere, and spending a lot of time out there, spending days and days at a time. That's kind of what Ron Moorhead did. He went out in the woods where he captured that Sierra Sounds and he had that conic base that he had set up out of sticks. What I just did was a very casual sort of walk through the woods there with uh, doing some call blasting and sort of checking it out. Um, I would love to go out in the woods with a, a group of fellow Sasquatch seekers and uh, scour the woods in every direction for a Sasquatch. But for the time being, I'm just kind of on my own, looking when I can and testing out different things. I think I do most of my Sasquatch researching when I read books because um, I think there's a lot of great reports out there, a lot of great books about the material and it's, it's good to kind of gather that uh, witness data and sort of see what people are saying they're seeing. And that's pretty cool. So yeah. So this has been my wandering through the woods. This is the end of my little Sasquatch nature walk there. I think I'm done for today. Thanks for watching. And mountaineers are always free.